Well, good morning, everyone. Happy Thursday morning to you, and welcome back to Morning Musings. My name is Don K. Preston. I'm the president of Preterist Research Institute of Ardmore, Oklahoma. Let me remind you, introducing my brand spanking new book, The Death of Adam, The Life of Christ. It is one of the most extensive discussions and studies of the nature of the death of Adam. Was it physical death that entered the day Adam sinned, or was it spiritual death? Or was it a combination of the two? Well, in this book, I deal with those questions and a whole lot more. Uh, by the way, the, my book includes a special linguistic study of the Hebrew of Genesis chapter 2, 15 to 17 by Dr. Dallas Burdett. It is a fantastic article. Uh, it, in my estimation, it's definitive. Uh, I haven't seen a single refutation of it. And by the way, you can read that article itself on my website, donkpreston.com. So be sure to do that. But again, introductory special price, October 2019, uh, I'm sorry, September and October. The book is regularly $19.95 plus $4.95 shipping. The introductory price, $17.95 total delivered price. And thank you so much for those of you who have ordered the book already. All right. We're looking at the Olivet Discourse and Jesus' teaching on the abomination that leads to desolation and the Great Tribulation. Now, we are told by men such as Greg Beale and others, perhaps others, that the Great Tribulation began in the first century. And it continues to this day. Now, I have not been able to find in Dr. Beale's writings, a, descri a description and a definition of exactly how the Great Tribulation continues to this day. All he does is make the assertion. And likewise, the former preterists who took that position never explained how it is that the Great Tribulation, which could be described even hyperbolically, as being the greatest that had ever been since the beginning of the creation and would never be anything like it again. Uh, no description. And by the way, no proof either. Not so much as a keystroke of proof. You know, I can assert anything. I can, I can get on these morning musings and say, you know what? I saw Bigfoot in my yard yesterday. Doesn't prove a thing, does it? So when Dr. Beale and former preterists as well assert that the Great Tribulation began back then and it's still ongoing today and will continue until the end of time, where's the proof of that? By the way, did you know there is currently a major scholarly book that has been published that demonstrates that violence has been decreasing in the world? since the time of Christ. Decreasing. Amazing eh? and important. Well, as I promised you yesterday, and to reiterate a couple of points that we made, I pointed out that the abomination of desolation would be placed in Judea. They could flee from the abomination. They could flee from the desolation, which is the tribulation, they can flee from that by leaving Judea. Now, that means the Great Tribulation has nothing to do with America or China or Russia or South America or India or any other location. The Great Tribulation is something that was, I, I hesitate to use the word local because People jump up and say, oh, well, if, you know, if it was local, then it's not important, which is a ridiculous argument. Nonetheless, uh, people want to make that argument. But it was confined, nonetheless, to the land of, of, of Israel. I believe it spanned the entire country. But the point of it still is it was not global in the sense that you and I think of. I shared with you that, that when that tribulation was approaching, they could flee from housetop to housetop to housetop. That doesn't apply to you and to me. It doesn't apply to our world. Let the one who is in the field not go back to get his goods. 
Woe to those who are pregnant, to those who are nursing in those days. And then he says, pray that your flight may not be in winter. Hey, we've got snow chains. And, and you know, uh, I, I, see, I see video of the people in Chicago, Buffalo, New York, Michigan, all these different places during the wintertime. And they got 14 feet of snow on the ground, it seems, and they're just driving right along. Snow plows are everywhere. Listen, folks, people could still travel in the wintertime in modern America, but you see, it wasn't true in the ancient times. You didn't dare try to travel in winter because of the treacherous, life-threatening situation. But then Jesus said, or on the Sabbath. Now, oh, by the way, for those of you who have asked, yes, I am still working on my book on the Sabbath. It is entitled, Celebrating the Eighth Day. I was going to name it Shemini Atzerat and... That got kiboshed. Okay. <laughs> uh, so anyway, yes, I'm still working on this. But here's what I want you to see in today's video. When you see the abomination of desolation, flee Judea and pray that your flight from Judea will not be on the Sabbath. Now let me ask you, if the tribulation is a worldwide event, if it is an ongoing event for the last 2,000 years, why did Jesus say, pray that your flight is not on the Sabbath? Now, here's the amazing thing. The very people who tell us that the Great Tribulation began in the first century and continues today, you know what they tell us? They tell us that the seventh-day Sabbath was annulled in the first century. Oh, wait a minute. If the seventh-day Sabbath, and folks, that's the only Sabbath Jesus is talking about here. If the seventh-day Sabbath was annulled in the first century, then that means that the supposed ostensible, imaginary, great tribulation of today has no application. I mean, after all, the great tribulation that Jesus is talking about would occur at the time when the Sabbath would be in effect. Now, by the way, just exactly what did this mean? Well, it goes back to the time of Ezra and Nehemiah. In the time of Nehemiah, Nehemiah saw that people were working on the Sabbath. They were traveling outside the city in violation of Deuteronomy and Exodus of not to travel on the Sabbath. They were just kind of going about their business. And so Nehemiah passed an edict. They closed the gates of the city of Jerusalem so that no man could do their professions on the Sabbath. The gates were closed. Let me ask you something. How many cities in America are surrounded by gates and the gates are closed and locked on the Sabbath, making flight from the cities impossible on the Sabbath? You see the problem? Pray that your flight will not be on the Sabbath. Look, folks, he's not talking about Sunday. This Sabbath here has nothing to do with Sabbath or Sunday as Christian Sabbath, as Dr. Beale likes to call it. Nothing. Totally unrelated. By the way, there is no such thing as a Christian Sabbath being Sunday. Absolutely unknown in Scripture. That is an invented and contrived doctrine. So when Jesus told his first century disciples who were living at the time in which the Sabbath was in effect, being imposed by the city gates being locked 
closed and locked and said, pray that your flight will not be on the Sabbath. And by the way, for those who say, well, you know, what we have here is a situation that is a little bit anachronistic. In other words, they tell us, you know, the Sabbath was actually nailed to the cross in 30 AD, but the Jews didn't accept it, and therefore they were still locking their gates. Well, that's strange. Paul in Colossians chapter 2, 14 to 6, pardon me, in Colossians 2, 14 to 16, said, let no man judge you in respect of new moons, feast days, and Sabbaths, which are present active indicative, when Paul wrote in approximately 62 AD, which are a shadow of the good things about to come. That which the Sabbath foretold, typified, and foreshadowed, salvation, resurrection, rest, had not yet become a reality when Paul wrote in, in the book of Colossians. That means it was still a shadow. If it's still a shadow, then the Sabbath law was still in effect when Paul wrote in Colossians chapter 2. You see, it gets back to the fact abomination of desolation, the tribulation, were covenantal sanctions. When Jesus said, pray that your flight will not be on the Sabbath, he was speaking of the time in which the Sabbath would still be in effect, still being applied. And that if they were Christians living in the city, surrounded by the walls, and the gates being closed on the Sabbath, they would be entrapped. This verse has absolutely nothing to do with present-day Sabbath observation and whether or not it's valid. Has absolutely nothing whatsoever to do with Sunday Sabbath, which is an unbiblical term. This passage has everything in the world to do with a time and a venue, a time when the Sabbath would still be binding, still being enforced, and that would prevent flight from Judea to the mountains to escape the Great Tribulation. That is what this passage is all about. To apply it to our day and our time is a miscarriage of exegesis. It is, in fact, eisegesis. Based upon a preconceived, a priori, presumptuous, may I say, theology, and I say this as kindly as possible with as much respect as possible, but that doctrine has no merit whatsoever. Well, thank you so much for joining me for this morning's Morning Musings. In the morning's video, I will continue my refutation of Sam Frost's book, A Parousia of the Son of Man. You don't want to miss it, so I'll see you on the flip side.